Hi, Medalita family. My name is Nina Dr. C. I'm a pulmonary critical care doctor, first year fellow working here on the front lines in Detroit, Wayne State University, uh, Detroit Regional Hospital, front lines of COVID-19. Feel free to ask me any questions you might have regarding the virus and tune in Sunday as I'll be, I'll be sharing my experiences, um, what I've been seeing, and just uh, answering all the questions you guys might have. Once again, that's this Sunday at Metalitogram. Hi friends, Metalita family. Good morning. My name is Nina Chandrasekharan. I'm going to be taking over Metalitogram today. So to begin, my name is uh, Nina once again. I am a pulmonary critical care intensivist first year fellow in my training here in Detroit, Michigan. I'm a, I am originally from uh, 954 Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but I'm here uh, for my training. So I'm part of the Wayne State University DMC system. Uh, it's been rough out here with COVID-19. We've definitely had our uh, fair share. So today my plan is to talk about my experiences, what I've been seeing um, and answering a lot of your guys' questions. So I decided to be a Metalita Graham ambassador um, almost a year now, and it's been wonderful. I absolutely love their products. I love their commitment to healthcare workers, what they do, and just their commitment to service to um, all of us and their their donations, their community work. All of it's just been just been great to work with. So today I will uh, be answering your guys' questions uh, live, and you can ask them. And I have a few questions already that have been coming my way. So I will try to get to them the best that I can. So since today is Sunday, it is a little different. Um, my morning routine just includes making some Dalgona coffee, the whipped coffee that I love so much on the weekends. However, on the days, I just grab a quick cup of coffee, uh, a little nutritious bar and head to my car and then kind of drive out. On my drive to work, I kind of reflect on um, just different things that I'm trying to mentally prepare to see. But you can never really mentally prepare yourself for what's to come in the ICU. You have 30 patients, you have 40, you have 20, you have a 30-year-old who is fighting for their life. You have a 60-year-old that's fighting for their life. It's just, um, you don't really know like kind of what to expect. So also something I do like to do in the mornings, I do sometimes watch the news. Not all the time and not all the sites or all the channels out there, but um, I trust CNN a lot and ABC. So these are my two usual go-tos. But once again, it's not good to trust everything that you read or every single person that you see, especially some celebrities as there have been accounts now and some reports that uh, false news is big out there. I also do read social media, um, not all the time. Once again, try to keep my mind off it as much as I can while I'm not at work. But uh, there are a few people that I do trust online. I will link these people to you throughout um, the takeover. So I get this question a lot uh, from my friends, my family, sometimes patients, colleagues. How has coronavirus 2 uh, impacted me mentally and emotionally? So that's a loaded question. It's, uh, it's a very broad answer. This has really definitely been quite a roller coaster. It has, I did not know what to expect, as I'm sure many of us did not know what to expect when this started about five weeks ago. Um, I'm practicing in Detroit, uh, again. It's, it is one of the hard hit areas. So going into work every day, we did not know what to expect. We did not know that there would be people, young people in their 20s and their 30s, impacted by this by this virus, we just thought it was all 60 year olds, 70 year olds. But even with the elderly people, it's just, it's just been so hard to see them on the ventilator alone. I think that's been one of the hardest challenges for me. So I was just focusing on the negatives, but um, no, there are definitely positives too. Positives when we don't have to intubate a patient. So in the ICU, we do accept some borderline patients that are like on the brink of needing to be intubated. We will keep them on non-invasive like high flow or a non-rebreather or venti mask sometimes. And um, hopefully we don't need to intubate them. That's always a positive because as we now know, early intubation can lead to uh, worsen outcomes. And patients on the, who are on the ventilator do have a higher mortality. We have been seeing that in a lot of reports now coming out from Italy, from China, and um, personal experience from what we've been seeing. So 
So uh, definitely some positives. Also, when we get to extubate a patient and send them home, that's that's always such a warming effect and all of us in the ICU get so excited when we get to extubate that patient and they don't get reintubated. There are times though that patients who do get extubated do get reintubated. What has been the most challenging part of this crisis? So the most challenging part of this crisis for me, uh, again, has been seeing these patients alone. Being alone, dying alone, just not with their families has been really hard. Uh, that is something that I do struggle with even to this day. We FaceTime the families, so that's been um, a major positive and I'm happy that at least the families can see something. That and just being so helpless in this crisis. There have been times when I'll have patients on 100% FiO2, 20 PEEP, people that are 20, 22, you switch their, their uh, mechanical vent settings to a different type, whether it's volume control to pressure control and nothing is working. And these are patients who have already gotten Plaquenil, have already gotten Azithro, have already gotten steroids, are on heparin, uh, have already gotten tocilizumab. We don't have Flolan. Um, these patients are sick and just it just seems like nothing helps. So you kind of just stand there and, well, you kind of just stand there. You watch them desaturate and there's nothing you can do and it's, it's frustrating and it's hard and it, it sucks. It sucks, this virus does definitely take it uh, take it out on you and I think those are the most challenging times for me uh, for sure how have you been coping that's a great question uh, I'm still trying to figure that out the perfect way or even what works well for me to this day I'm still trying to figure it out but um, what I have been doing is I have a great support system here in terms of my attendings my colleagues my friends uh, my family FaceTime Zoom uh, texting even and kind of just having my family friends be there for me that's been a huge plus uh, social media has been great all the, all of my friends that I've been reaching out to on insta have been just amazing it's uh, really pulling everyone together so that's been positive after codes we will be as in my team and I all the nurses the respiratory techs um, we do debrief we try to figure out well what can we do differently if this were to happen again? Which unfortunately, there's nothing too much. I mean, it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say because most of these patients have already been optimized in the therapies and treatments that we could give them. They've already been proned. Like I said before, they've already gotten to, uh, the IL-6 inhibitor. They've already gotten Plaquenil. They've already gotten steroids. They've already gotten azithro. Uh, they haven't responded to proning. So it's kind of like this just takes its course and unfortunately some patients have a bigger immune response to this virus than others which we're starting to learn more and more about the type h and type l other things we do to boost morale um, in my icu we play music we bump uh, some heartwarming music and that definitely does boost our morale also headspace app has been good to just stop and reflect like being a clinician so i pretty much answered um this earlier what it's like to be a clinician on the front front line of this um, pandemic it's rough it's not easy uh it's there have been a lot of times where you've just felt hopeless but um there have also been times of gratitude where you get to see your patient extubated and discharged home so it's a roller coaster there's also been so much kindness and support from the community and just uh, doctors banding together all of the different specialties, which has really, really just been incredible. For example, on my team in the ICU, um, in the VA, I have a GI attending, a cardio attending, a cardio fellow, and a rheumatology fellow all on the same team to take care of patients in the ICU. That has just been so amazing and such a great collaborative effort to see everybody sticking together. Also, the outpour from the community in general, all these big companies just reaching out to help like um, 3M, like uh, all these, yeah, all these uh, hand companies, these skincare companies that have been reaching out asking us if we need help. Even the local companies bringing us food, even something as simple like that has just been so heartwarming and gratifying so that's just been very what gives you the most hope great question so i think what gives me the most hope is the way that the, the u.s has banded together for the most part in terms of 
really adhering to physical or social distancing and helping to flatten the curve, a term we've heard over and over multiple times, and we will continue to hear it. Uh, just given all the restrictions that have been placed, I know it's hard to stay at home. I can only imagine how hard it is with kids and uh, all the differences that we are all facing together as one. But just everybody coming together to realize how big this is, that this is bigger than any of us, has just given me hope. And seeing our numbers go down has just been wonderful. What are the most common myths about COVID-19 that physicians should dispel for patients? Well, the first one, guys, this is real. This is not a hoax. This is not a lie. This is real. This is what we are seeing. We as front care line physicians, respiratory techs, respiratory therapists, nurses, uh, healthcare workers, you name it, we're out there and we're seeing this. This is real. Mortality is real. This has caused real death. There, almost everybody at this point knows somebody who has been affected by this disease. It is wild to me that people do not believe this and continue to think that this is a hoax. So I did just get a question in regards to uh, what's the cause of the, of the elevation in D-dimer, CRP, and ferritin that we are seeing. This is a great question. So the exact mechanism is unknown. However, D-dimer... Uh, this is a fibrin degradation product that we normally see after a blood clot is degraded by um, the process of fibrinolysis. So because we are seeing this elevated more and more now, the thought is that the body is forming microthrombi to uh, other systemic uh, organs in our body like the kidneys, for example, and um, forming PEs and DVTs, clots all over, strokes, and... Uh, we are seeing this because that's the, well, the theory behind it. Um, renal failure is big in these patients. Patients who end up on the ventilator, almost 50% of them, if not more, need CRT, continuous renal replacement therapy, or a hemodiagnosis. And it's questionable whether this is because of the microthrombi or this is because of acute tubular necrosis or volume overload, meaning the kidneys are not getting enough perfusion. They're not getting enough blood supply, whether it is because of a clot or because this virus in general causing the vascular permeability that's making all the blood vessels just um, vasodilate instead of and when they vasodilate, they, uh, that decreases blood pressure. And then so the, blood, the body just compensates by giving perfusion to the main organs and um, not to the kidney. So that is the thought behind uh, acute tubular necrosis as well. Uh, ferritin and LDH are both inflammatory, and CRP actually. They're um, acute inflammatory markers that are elevated in times when uh, the body is undergoing a virus or trying to fight something off. This is a normal reaction of the immune system. However, in COVID-19, we are starting to see that this is a hyper-inflammatory response of the, um, of, the, um, of the immune system. So in patients where we see these extremely elevated, we, it's more of a poor mortality sign. These are patients that are on the ventilator. Their ferritins will be greater than 3,000, uh, CRP greater than 20, uh, D-dimer will be greater than 5,000. Um, CPK will even be elevated. CPK, uh, that's a term that um, is for a marker that is elevated we see in muscle breakdown or rhabdomyolysis, which also causes kidney injury. So the exact mechanism is unknown. However, we are um, postulating and we use these markers to look at mortality and how we should go about down, or rhabdomyolysis, which also causes kidney injury. So the exact mechanism is unknown. However, we are um, postulating and we use these markers to look at mortality and how we should go about treating these patients. So we were, we had, um, we as in my, my program, my institution and other institutions around as well had certain criteria markers that you have to hit before getting a getting treatment with a specific uh, therapy like the a getting treatment with a specific uh, therapy like the IL-6 inhibitor so for example for us it was if you have a CRP greater than 20 ferritin greater than 1500 uh, and or LDH greater than um, 250 something like that then um, then you'd qualify however we are seeing now that and it just makes more sense that you should 
we should be avoiding having these patients getting to that specific point because once they're at that point there's not much you can do else the immune system has taken over and all their vessels are vasodilated their kidneys they're on they're on crt or hemodialysis at that point they're on pressors they're on mechanical ventilation they're on high settings all this vascular permeability is and all these um all these cells are just these uh, cd8 cells they're all just flocking to the um, the lungs the alveoli decreasing perfusion decreasing um, oxygenation ventilation so so essentially for a patient to get to that hyperactivated uh, response of their immune system we are hoping to avoid giving these medications earlier on giving il6 inhibitors earlier on giving remdesivir earlier on higher doses of steroids to just stop the immune system stop the major players in this virus from activating the immune system should hopefully cause a better outcome in these patients so they just don't get to that level What risk factors are you seeing more associated with this virus? That's a great question too. So we're seeing a lot of uh, patients with underlying comorbidities, including high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and uh, renal disease. Honestly, we're not seeing a lot of immunosuppressed people. In fact, we have our ICU here uh, that is dedicated to taking care of pa cancer patients, uh, bone marrow transplant, and the numbers in the ICU have been less, which is very, very interesting. What about the current crisis worries you the most? Well, besides the crisis itself that's uh, worrying me, it's uh, the fear of the unknown for sure. With this virus, it's acting in so many different ways uh, that we have never seen. It is bigger than the flu. It's bigger than the any other pandemic that we have had. So that that is scary. Uh, we still don't have a treatment to this day as yet. There are lots of clinical trials going on. Uh, again, it's scary to treat something that you just you don't know. People depend on us as healthcare providers, and we we are obviously doing our best, but our best just sometimes just doesn't feel enough when we don't know what we're dealing with. Also, another thing that does worry me is the highly debated topic of when are we going to reopen this country and how are we going to reopen this country? Is it too early to reopen this country? In my personal opinion, being a jaded ICU physician, seeing what I'm seeing every day, I do think it's a little too early to open the country. But um, in my personal opinion, being a jaded ICU physician, seeing what I'm seeing every day, I do think it's a little too early to open the country. But um now there are all these protests of people having to stay at home and it's incredible to me that people are protesting staying at home. I just, yeah, it is it is incredible to me. I mean, these people should take a look or a walk through ICU and see what, what is happening and what is actually going on. That That is a... I guess it's a highly debated topic now that places like Florida, my home, <laughs> its beaches are starting to open up. I do agree with the restrictions when these places are starting to open up, like certain timings. For example, when Jacksonville Beach did open up, uh, they had time from like 11 to 3 p.m. and then again from 5 to 8, so like three-hour increments times two a day that you could go to the beach and it had to be less Jacksonville Beach did open up uh they had time from like 11 to 3 p.m and then again from 5 to 8 so like three hour increments times two a day that you could go to the beach and it had to be less than 50 people they had guards watching so i mean i understand the country does need to open up that is a great way to start it just scares me what's going to happen are we going to see a sudden second rise in these numbers these drastic numbers so that is scary Should the public be wearing masks? Yes, I do think, and uh, there has been science to back up the fact that everybody is contagious. Everybody, when they sneeze, they cough, they walk, they talk in a close proximity, or even walking by 
one another, it has shown that um, it's very easy to spread these germs. So I do think that the public should be wearing masks for a certain period of time. What can physicians do to manage increased capacity and conserve PPE and practices? So that's a great question. It's unprecedented times. Um, reusing PPE is a big thing I know in some places. We get one N95 per shift unless we're going to be doing a um, procedure like intubation. Then we'll get, well, another N95. So we will bulk our medication doses to a certain time. So we only have nurses go in at a certain time to give the meds along with doing labs at the same time. We try not to do, like if someone's in DKA, we won't do blood glucose every hour. We'll do blood glucose every four hours, something like that. Um, we'll also avoid IV pushes and do drips instead. In all of our hospitals, we have uh, tubing to go outside of the room, so that's just been good. Also for physical exam, we will uh, just have one person really go into the room to like listen to the patient and stuff. What steps can doctors take to stay healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic? I think all healthcare workers in general, it's hard for frontline workers to stay healthy during this pandemic. It's hard to wear N95, to wear a mask on top of that, goggles, face shields, bouffant caps all the time and drink water. To take all that stuff off just to drink water, it's hard. It's uh, it's not easy, but I'm um, taking vitamin C, trying to keep your immune system well by sleeping good amount of hours, which I know is very hard. Um, avoiding the news at all like all the time, avoiding social media. There's always things going on that are, um, that can mess with, uh, and that can mess with your headspace and cause anxiety. Eating properly, eating greens, talking to friends, family, just having good vibes around you is, is definitely important. And it's so important to keep a good um, mental health as well. All right, guys, looks like we're uh, winding down to the last few questions here. Um, are you nervous that you're going to get coronavirus? Yeah, I am pretty nervous that I'm going to get coronavirus if I haven't already gotten it by now. Uh, I actually do keep a thermometer and a pulse ox. The pulse ox is not really, I didn't buy it for this. I bought it because, um, well, I am pulmonary, so I take this on rounds with me for my palm patients. But I do check myself if I do have a cough or feel sick. Yeah, so... Long story short, I am nervous. I'm nervous because I don't want to infect anybody else. I'm nervous I don't want to infect my patients. I don't want to infect my family when I see them. I, I don't want to be an asymptomatic carrier. What options are available for private practices to continue to treat patients during the pandemic? So uh, personally speaking, I do have family members that are in private practice and lots of friends. So I do know that they have been uh, seeing patients via telemedicine or virtual encounters, phone calls, and have and they have been able to bill for these. So if you are a private practitioner and you are looking to do this, there are lots of resources out there. What foundation would you recommend following or donating to for their efforts to help with this crisis? Real Heroes Need Masks is a great foundation. It, uh, it helps donate masks to hospitals that are in need. Uh, there's also a lot of GoFundMes out there for um, certain regional locations, but I do know Real Heroes Need Masks does uh, donate to all over, so um, that is definitely appreciated. <laughs> How long will this go on? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, it's near impossible to say. We don't know if this virus is affected by temperature, if summer will the heat will destroy this virus we don't know if this will have a rebound back in the winter time we we really have um no idea it's very unprecedented we are starting to see plateaus in certain areas which is a huge positive in michigan for example where i am we have seen a plateau and instead of testing thousands positive a day we're only now seeing like 500 600 so that's huge but other places like massachusetts and um, philly pennsylvania their numbers are starting to skyrocket who knows who's next so it's it's definitely difficult to say. What precautions should I take when delivering things such as groceries to my grandparents to limit my exposure to them? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, precautions to take to when seeing vulnerable people, elderly people, even parents, grandparents, continue the normal routine stuff. Wash your hands, sneeze into your uh, elbow, cough into your elbow, wear a mask. Try not to stay within um, six feet of them. Maintain your distance. Don't hug. Don't kiss. Uh, 
just if you are sick, if you have a cold, if you have a, if you're sneezing, if you feel like you have a tickle in your throat, don't go visit them. Just maintaining things like these will hopefully give them. Maintain your distance. Don't hug. Don't kiss. Uh, just if you are sick, if you have a cold, if you have a, if you're sneezing, if you feel like you have a tickle in your throat, don't go visit them. Just maintaining things like these will hopefully uh, avoid passing this down to people who are vulnerable. What is the long-term strategy? Well, that's a great question. The long-term strategy is going to be a vaccine. We don't know when this vaccine will be available. Um, likely 18, 16 months, minimum a year. It takes a lot for a vaccine to go through trials and for it to um, come out to the population. However, that would be the best. Before that, hopefully finding a a good treatment for this will be great, whether it's using a tocilizumab or any of the IL-6s or remdesivir early on, or if it's uh, convalescent plasma antibodies, testing everybody for antibodies and and uh, getting all these antibodies and giving it to people who get sick. So there has to be some type of treatment for this and um, and a vaccine. That would be the long term long term management for this. All right, guys. Well, it's been so great being able to do this, to share my experiences, to answer your guys' questions. And hopefully you guys learned something or um, took something away from this. We are far from it being over. We are far from seeing the end of it. But um, but we're getting there. As long as we stay home, we all flatten the curve. Like We've, we've heard this so many times, but um, you will keep hearing it. Um, final advice for people taking care of these patients just hang in there you all you all are doing a great a wonderful phenomenal job and it's really important that we take care of ourselves along with taking care of these patients so um once again thank you guys so much for tuning in uh, my username on insta is uh, ninzi and i can give you my email address through a message if you'd like follow-up answers or um, anything you'd like to discuss regarding what i spoke about Thanks again, Metalita fam.